Welcome back to this third segment of Contract Law Consideration. We have been considering the area of consideration and in particular in the last segment we were looking at Stilken Merrick, contrasting it with Hartley and Ponsonby and then of course I introduced you to Williams and Ruffy at the end. Now we are going to spend the entirety of this next segment looking at Williams and Ruffy Brothers because the case is one which does require some consideration given its importance in this area in particular. The fact is that it has obviously uh, affected the law somewhat in this area. Just by way, to, way of introduction, it's interesting to note that when you look at the US position on this, for example, in the US, they have these old set of rules relating to how you deal with contracts and they have the uniform commercial code. Now, one of the things that I want you to think about as we go through Ruffy is that when you look at the uniform commercial code uh, for contract in the US, one of the things it is concerned with is that if you're looking at a variation of a contract, it doesn't require you to have any further consideration because what they consider is this, when the parties were in the contract initially, so I contract you to build my house, I gave consideration for that and obviously you did as well. So if along the continuum, I then decide that, or you decide that, well, you need extra money to do this, that, or the other based on what you're going to be doing on the house. The law there says, well, you don't really need a new consideration for that because once you have the original consideration, the variation uh, of a contract doesn't necessarily need that. Now, you may want to look at, for example, how Ruffy has been discussed and see whether or not you have any thoughts in relation to whether they have borrowed somewhat from the US jurisdiction. That said then, Williams and Ruffy. Ruffy brothers were contracted by Shepherds Bush, Asso uh, Shepherds Bush Housing Association Limited to refurbish 27 flats in London. Now they subcontracted the carpenter, Mr. Lester Williams, for £20,000 and it was supposed to be paid in installments. Now, some of the work was done and they paid him approximately £16,000. Mr. Williams, of course, ran, ran into financial difficulties because, as building work usually is, the price ended up being too low. Now, here's an interesting question. When was the last time you ever heard of a building contract coming in on time or under budget. Never would be more likely, but fact of the matter is, turned out that the price was too low. Now, Ruffy Brother was going to be liable under a penalty clause for late completion. So they had a meeting in the spring of 1986 and promised an extra 575 pounds per flat if Williams completed on time. So do the math, 575, 27 flats is, is going to have some kind of uh, incentive there. Well, Williams did eight of the flats and then he sort of cottoned on that they weren't going to pay him any monies because he had only got about 1,500 by then, which roughly covered just under three of the flats. So new carpenters were brought in, Williams claimed, now, the court held that Williams should get the eight times 575 with a few deductions, of course, for any defects and some of the money owing uh, in the original sum. Now, the court said that he, he had agreed that the original price was too low and that raising it to a reason, reasonable level was, of course, in the interest of both sides. Now, Lord Justice Glidewell held that Williams had provided good consideration even though he was merely performing a pre-existing duty. Now, the court found for Williams and he said that the idea of promissory estoppel was not properly argued and not yet been fully developed in that situation. But he said the concept of economic duress 
provided an answer to Stilk's old problem, the test for understanding whether a contract could legitimately be varied was, and he, though Justice Gladwell, set out certain requirements where, in circumstances where you are already under a pre-existing duty, you can still, of course, move on and um, use that as good consideration. And he said this, if A has contracted with B to, uh, for work, and before it is done, A has reason to believe B may not be able to complete, and A promises B more to finish on time, and A obtains in practice a benefit or obviates a disbenefit from giving the uh, promise, and there is no economic duress or fraud, then the practical benefit constitutes good consideration. Now, the, another name, of course, for practical benefit is factual benefit. Now, on Stilk uh, and Merrick, Lord Justice Glidewell said, it is not, in my view, surprising that a principle that was enunciated in relation to the rigors of seafaring life during the Napole Napoleonic Wars should be subjected during the succeeding one 180 years to a process of refinement and limitation in its application to the present day. The point is, he's saying you're looking at situations on the high seas approximately 200 years ago. Those sort of things should not necessarily have an impact on the reality of contemporary society. So what we have here is a situation where it wasn't as if Mr. Williams went to uh, Ruffy Brothers and held a gun to their heads and say, right, you need to give me £575 extra. They went to them and they agreed it. Now, there was no economic duress and the point being made here is if we're looking at a situation absent economic duress, why shouldn't the parties who have agreed not then be able to use that? Now, Lord Justice Russell, for his part, said the courts nowadays should be more ready to find considerations existence so as to reflect the intention of the parties to the contract where the bargaining powers are not unequal. And he said that Ruffy Brothers employ Mr. Cottrell, Cottrell felt the original price to be less than reasonable. Frankly, had they not, there would be no reason for them to have gone back to then say, right, we will agree this. Because, of course, it appeared that um, it was established that it was somewhat low. And so there was a further need to replace the haphazard method of payment by a more formalized scheme of money per flat. And he said, True it was that the plaintiff did not undertake to do any work additional to that which he had originally undertaken to do, but the terms upon which he was to carry out the work were varied. Go back to what I was saying about America. Now, in the US, and certainly the UCC, suggests that where you're looking at a variation of a contract, there is no necessity for any new consideration. So, he says, and in my judgment, that variation was supported by consideration which a pragmatic approach to the true relationships between the parties readily demonstrates. So as far as the courts were concerned, the fact that in there was no, well, on the facts, there was no economic duress. The one party had gone to the other. They had asked for it to be, um, for them to carry on because what was the alternative? The alternative, of course, was there was a subsisting contract. And Ruffy Brothers could, when Williams said to them, well, we can't do it anymore, was to say, fine, and treat themselves as discharged from the contract and, of course, sue for damages. They may, of course, have taken a rather more sensible view and think, well, given that they don't have the money, what would be the point of that exercise? And therefore say, well, we might as well keep them on. Be that as it may, the point is that when they went to them and said to them, it's okay, come on board, and for what you're asking for, we're happy, the court said, based on that variation, the practical benefit or a practical benefit arose, and so they were responsible. Now, let's just review the rationale for consideration in the whole Williams case. Well, when you look at what I will term 
the Williams type consideration. It is clear that it is generated by the alteration promise and there is no moving from the promise C because the promise C is already contractually bound. Rather, it involves a practical, factual, that is, benefit to the promisor without any required corresponding legal detriment to the promisee. I want you to savor that for a minute because the point is well made. Is that go back to where we're saying you're saying that factually there is a benefit, but we're not seeing any legal detriment as we know it. So there is no corresponding legal detriment to the promisee, although there is a factual factual detriment in obviously performing the contractual duty which he already owes. Now, although the artificial nature of the Williams Doctrine has been subject to severe criticism, and certainly we see in the case of South Caribbean Trading and Traffic Europe here in 2004, we see Justice Coleman there not being very happy about the decision in Williams because he said that it upset the long-standing rule. Be that as it may, the court seemed to have generally embraced the doctrine because even Justice Coleman himself in Trafigura had to concede and of course follow Williams. Now, there is an interesting point with Williams that, again, if you really go into the depth of cases, it is something that will come out of it. And it is this. The two reports on the still case differ in their analysis. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, just from a, a, a crude explanation, um, as a barrister at law, I mean, now it's not so bad for persons like myself, but certainly when you look at, you know, back in the times of Silk and Merrick, the way barristers worked was they would go to court and they would write out the law reports and that was really their source of income. So you could have, for example, two barristers, you know, listening to a case and then they would do the court reports and then they would sell the court reports and that was part of their income. Now, the thing is that in the still case, there were two court reporters. There was the Campbell's reports and there was the Espinos reports. Now, when you look at the two reports, there is a difference in their analysis. Now, in the Espinos report, it said that Stilk was unsuccessful because of policy. In the Campbell's report on the case, they said the claim failed not on policy, but that there was no consideration. No consideration. Now, it is the Campbell's report, the no consideration, which has been accepted in English law because Espinas was not a very well-regarded law reporter. So it is clearly very surprising or even interesting that it is the policy argument from the Espinas report which most supports the Williams position. Interesting, something to bear in mind. And certainly if you're doing an essay, it is something that I would flag up for the examiners. Now, what we are going to do at this point, though, is take a short break. And when we come back, I will finish off with part payment and promissory estoppel. <music> 